Welcome to Parati 100, a podcast dedicated to exploring the life and legacy of Indian national poet C. Subramania Parati, 100 years after his death. This is Meera T. Sundararajan, Parati's great granddaughter. In this next segment of my conversation with renowned filmmaker Michael Wood about Subramaniam Bharati, we discuss one of the areas in which Bharati's contributions are most famous, his advocacy of women and his role as a passionate champion of women's rights. For Bharati, freedom for women was at the heart of everything that he believed in. In fact, it was a prerequisite for freedom for the Indian nation as a whole. This topic also gave me an opportunity to talk a little bit about what happened to Bharati's legacy when he died, how it passed into the hands of women, the women in his family, his wife, Chalama, and his two daughters, Thangamal and Shakuntala. I've recently written an article published in the Hindu, India's national newspaper, entitled Poet of the Feminine, where I speak in more detail about the trials faced by Chalama and her daughters after Bharati's death and how they overcame them. In Chalama's case, she did so to become Bharati's first publisher and his first biographer. No small feat under any circumstances, but particularly in the light of the obstacles that she faced, an amazing series of achievements. Her story is an amazing story in its own right. I hope you'll enjoy this next part of my conversation with Michael. There's so many fantastic areas of his of his work which have such relevance to us today. And I think one that will strike every reader who picks the book up in a bookshop and turns the pages and and alights on the passages about about women. Uh, mm. Do you want to say a few words about his attitude to women's liberation, his attitude to women's equality, and um, and indeed a little perhaps of his development himself as a man in that respect? Absolutely. Well, in terms of his attitude towards women's equality, we could easily talk all night just about this one issue. To say that he was a champion of women's freedom and equality is an extreme understatement. (laughs) This idea is something that he was so absolutely committed to. And in a way, it was the foundation of all of his other ideological constructions as well. You know, because he saw this in very basic terms that without women's equality, half of society, a little more than half of society, was not free. And so he couldn't talk about freedom without talking about freedom for women. Now, I think that at some level, the the calculus involved is that basic. But then, as is typical for him, he thought very deeply about this and got involved in considering more about the actual role of women in society. What role do they play as compared to men and how do we measure those roles in terms of their social significance? And for him, he actually realized that women, in a sense, were the preservers and propagators of culture. So he said, well, we think about women as as renewing our population, you know, obviously by being mothers, but then what about this role that they play in actually maintaining and renewing our culture? Because women are the ones through, through the home through the continuance of the language which they speak in the home and pass on to their children, through the knowledge of the traditions that they maintain, all the folk traditions of India, 
uh, mm -hmm. the cooking, all of the knowledge of the medicinal properties of foods and so on, so many, um, the dress, textiles. I mean, there's no area of cultural life where women's input isn't absolutely central. And mm -hmm. this is what he he basically came to realize and, and discusses in various ways in those essays. He says, well, women are culture. They ultimately are the representatives and the keepers of the culture of India. And therefore, their role is to preserve civilization. And he says, to civilize men. He says, without, without the influence of women, men aren't engaged in the production or creation of civilization. They fight wars and kill each other. This is more what, what he sees, I think, quite, quite unflatteringly. But you know, I think that's more his, his crude view of the sort of male social urges. And he says, well, woman's role is to civilize men and to to help them to become builders of civilization. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, he arrives at a point not only where he sees women's equality as being important, but he actually sees women as being higher up in the social hierarchy than men because they play this very central role in the propagation of culture and civilization. So he wanted women to be the leaders of society for that reason. And for example, he wrote this very famous poem in Tamil called Pudumai Pen. Pen means woman. Pudumai means a new style or a new kind. So a new kind of woman. And in this poem, he describes his ideal woman. And he says, well, this is a woman who's going to be highly educated. She is the leader of society. She is the one who is going to write our laws. And this is the proper social expression of what women should be doing. They should be leading us. Right. And Michael, you asked another question, if, if I might just continue for a moment. Yeah. I wanted to answer that as well, uh, which is about his own evolution as a man, mm. which I think is such a, a fascinating question. So I think that he grew up in a fairly conventional environment in some senses, but when he was very young, he lost his mother. And that was an important event in his psychological development. I've actually learned that many people who become notable in later life lose their parents when they're very young. So it's interesting to think about that, that there was a sort of maturation process that occurred in him as a result of that terrible mm -hmm. loss. Um, but then he uh, had an epiphany, <laughs> and I, I, I use that word deliberately, when uh, he actually went to one of the Congress meetings. I believe it was the Surat Congress. And on the way back, he had the opportunity to meet Sister Nivedita, who was, uh, of course, a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, a European lady who had come to India and adopted as her mission Vivekananda's teachings and became very involved in women's education in India. And so she was one of the figures of the national movement that Bharati wanted to meet. And he sat down with her for a meeting during this trip. And when he went to see her, she asked him, oh, uh, where's your wife? And so he explained to her, he said, well, my, my wife is back home. And in our country, we don't have the custom of bringing our women with us to these meetings and so on. And she said, well, uh, you're, you're making a terrible mistake here. You know, your wife needs to be alongside you in everything that you're undertaking, especially for the country, for the good of the country. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm putting words in because what I have to explain is much more difficult without words. But what he actually says is that without saying anything, she taught him the meaning of service to the country. Mm. So there was a mystical aspect to this meeting. And thereafter, he became completely, he was set on the path towards his understanding of women's role in the national struggle. And I can tell you a small personal anecdote in that regard, too, because there's a story that I've heard from my mother about Bharati and his wife, Chalama, that one day Bharati was preparing to go out and lead a protest. And Chalama was worried about him. And she said, oh, what will I do if something happens to you and you are killed in the course of this meeting? So Bharati apparently turned to her and said, oh, don't worry at all. If something happens to me, you come out, you take the flag from my hands, you hold it high, and you lead the meeting. <laughs> mm. 
Great. Here's, that's looking at the, the role of women in the freedom struggle. But we can't, we can't leave his writings on women that are in the book without looking at the, the status of women in India in that First World War period, because his language in those essays is really incredibly powerful and straight down the line, isn't it? You know, the situation is, yes. is disgusting. Uh, women yes. are slaves. Yeah. Women are, uh, I mean, he, the progress has been tragically slow. Um, he's, he's adamant that uh, Indian society's treatment of women is pervasively evil. Yes, I think that's such an important point that you raise because, again, with hindsight, I think everyone sort of knows that the position of women wasn't very good at that time particularly in India, but I think that was more or less the case everywhere, but particularly in mm. India. Mm. But it's difficult to appreciate the extent of the problem. And mm. what he says, I think he actually uses the expression, he says, there's no point in shrinking from strong words yes. when you have to tell terrible facts. And absolutely, he says, you know, this is a situation of enslavement and it must be resolved immediately. So the situation at that time was absolutely as bad as we think it was, and even worse. And in fact, you also saw that play out in the lives of his family, because it's an interesting thing that, in a way, Bharati's entire legacy became a legacy of women, because when he passed away, his wife was left. And I mean, she was a 30... 31 year old young woman at the time. Mm. And then he had two daughters, you know, one who was a teenager and one who was even younger. And so these mm. were the, the people that were ultimately left with his legacy, which I think in a sense is how he would have wanted it. Yeah. But at the same time, there were a, a great many challenges that arose out of that situation. But mm. just to go back to your question about the status of women, you know, my mother didn't like to talk very much about the period in her grandmother's life after Bharati passed away. My mother was brought up by Chalama Bharati until she was 16, until my mother was 16. And so she knew about all of this from Chalama's own narration and from the narration of Tangama Bharati, the poet's elder daughter, who was my mother's mother. And she's just said enough to me that I can understand the cruelty that unfolded after Bharati's death because Chalama became a widow. And that pretty much was the worst thing that could happen to you if you were a woman living in the early 1900s in India. Yeah. And so she immediately became a non-person as far as Indian society was concerned. Her mm. uh, head was shaved. She even lost the right to wear clothes. You know, they didn't allow a woman mm. to wear a blouse in those days if she was a widow. Just a piece mm. of cloth was all you had to wrap around you, a white sari. And... Uh, Chalama allowed herself to some extent to become socialized as a widow. That was the environment in which she lived. And I don't think she had very much choice. And the forces, the pressures that could be brought to bear upon women, including physical coercion, were tremendous at the time. So this helps us to understand how visionary and how far in advance of his time Bharati really was. Mm -hmm. Because to go from that situation to the point where he's saying, well, women should be the leaders of our society, mm -hmm. it's an almost unthinkable distance that needs to be bridged. And Chelema, to her credit entirely, in her life, she bridged that distance in a lot of ways because she took on the trappings of widowhood without any choice in that matter, but she nevertheless went on and tried to get Bharati's works published, tried to um, bring out their importance and make sure that they continued to play a role in the freedom struggle and that she did so as well, in spite of these tremendous obstacles and pressures that she faced. So I think going back to the Pudumai Pen idea, I think the first Pudumai Pen was actually Chelama. She was the Pudumai Pen that the poet saw with his own eyes. And uh, it's quite something to to contemplate the the situation of women as it was then, and the situation that he wanted is quite 
amazing to contemplate what he saw and then how the women in the family, starting with Chelema and coming right down to the present day, we've all tried to live out the dream and the vision and embrace that. Mm -hmm. With a lot of success in many areas, would you say, Mira? I mean, my own experience of 35 years in Tamil Nadu with a fa family of women who we almost treat as our own family, mm -hmm. um, a widowed mum, uh, widowed 20 odd years ago, four daughters, uh, independent, educated women of ord very ordinary class of people, confident and uh, certainly not taking, you know, bullshit, if I can use that word, from men and, uh, you know, very kind of active. I remember even 35 years ago traveling around with the unmarried daughters to go to temples and things. And they said, no, it was all right. So, you know, we go on public transport together. And it was a different India now, you know. So maybe maybe these things kind of filter down over time. And as you pointed out at the beginning of this, it's not as if women's freedom has been achieved anywhere else <laughs> in the way that it yeah. should. Do you think, do you think, I mean, one of the things that strikes me when I read the book is that um, he drew on a lot of ideas from many different cultures, didn't he? He, Absolutely. Was, in a, he was in a swim of a revolutionary movement. And, and, uh, and in one sense, some of these absolutely clear opinions that he had about the caste system, about women and so on, they perhaps born of his own conscience, but he was... Um, he definitely sympathised with some of the, the some of the aims of the French Revolution, didn't he? The, the very movement that had the very movement that had um, you know radicalised Europe, um, the essential ideas of liberté, égalité, and fraternité. He believed in those too. Yes, absolutely, and and I think that uh, uh, it's absolutely delightful to think how he adopted and even co-opted the language of, of revolutionary France, of the individual rights-based tradition in English and so on. Mm -hmm. he, he adopted this language for his cause, so absolutely. And in fact, that motto, the motto of the French Revolution, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, he adopted that for one of his own magazines. So it, it was a very strong influence and perfectly expressed in many ways his own um, ideals. And to go back to, to your comments about the situation of, of women and how successful that whole process has been over the generations, I think that first and foremost, I have to say, my strongest feeling is hats off to Indian women. Yeah. Because the Indian women that I have seen as well in so many walks of life over the years, I'm always astonished by how much they appear to be able to do, and maybe even most importantly, how they maintain such a strong sense of identity, yes. of, of self, self-worth and self-esteem that allows them to stand their ground. You know, whether we're talking about a school principal or a, a chemistry tutor or uh, a musician or, you know, and, and they manage to be active in, in all of these spheres, notwithstanding the, the tremendous obstacles that they've inherited from the more negative side of the Indian cultural traditions. So absolutely. And I think that the, the role played by Bharati as a poet has been to give these women an affirmation as well. You know, this, this is one of the, the curious things, I think, that when we have great visionaries like this who write, and who write with such clarity, as you say, about what the morals of the society really should be, what is the right and the wrong, and then there remains a gap between their writing and what's actually happening in the society. Well, those who want to effect change, or even very simply, those who want to carry on and have individually meaningful lives, they have those words at their disposal. And that's something that they can fall mm. back upon. Well, I'm doing what our visionary Mahakavi, the greatest poet of our country, wrote about. I'm being the kind of woman that he imagined in his put my pen poem. So I, I would like to think that that's something important that, that Bharati has provided to the womanhood of India. 
you know, that yeah. sense of, yes, I've, I've got your back. Here are the yeah. words that you can use to, to carry things forward. Mm. Um, I mean, as far as the family is concerned, that's a very complex question and very interesting one that I've asked myself over the years or posed to myself over the years, because I think there have been successes and failures. You know, in Chelema's own case, her entire reason for living, I, I think it's no exaggeration to say that, was the preservation and dissemination of her husband's writings. Mm. She believed so completely in his poetry, and it had a very personal meaning for her as well, because she was a woman without really any significant access to formal education. Mm. You know, she was married when she was seven, again, going back to that era, and Bharati writes about the child marriage, which he sees as a completely barbaric undertaking. And, and in fact, he describes it very dramatically in the uh, essay on that subject in the book, describes babies being plucked yelling from the arms of their parents to be wedded, quote unquote, to one another and so on. Mm. So, uh, so what she actually did was she learned all of her husband's poetry from him, and she had memorized most of it. People say she had memorized all of it. That was her education. That was her language. And when she was dying, this, is, this story is from eyewitness accounts. So my, my mother, for example, saw this with her own eyes. She was present there. So she had fallen into a coma when she was completely unresponsive. And in that coma, she was singing the lines of Bharati's poems. If you can imagine that in her unconscious state, this is actually what was happening in her brain. And I don't think it's something that even neuroscience can explain. How can someone in a coma be singing lines of poetry? It's just an amazing event. But it, it really shows how completely she was immersed in mm. that literature. So she succeeded partially in her undertaking. She was able to bring out some books, but then there was a definite limit to how much she could do because of the circumstances surrounding her life as a widow and so on, mm. with no education, very impoverished. So she actually had to give up the copyright to male relatives in the family. And I think that that was in many ways a defeat for her. And then in terms of her daughter's lives, um, Thangama, the elder daughter, who had been somewhat older, you know, fully grown by the time her father passed away, she actually became a writer. Mm. Oh, and I should say something important about Chalama too, which is that she made the first biography of Bharati called Bharati Charitram. So the portrait of Bharati, but she did not know how to write. So she dictated the biography to Thangamar, who wrote it down for her. And that was the seminal work in Bharati's biography studies, it was the work oh. of, of Chalama. Oh. Thangamar then became a writer in her own right, as well as uh, speaking and disseminating words about her father. She became a writer in her own right. And then, of course, my mother became the first academic scholar of Bharati, and has done a lifetime's worth of, of writing on him as well. So the work has been carried on. I do think that there has been a sense of neglect surrounding the work, though, that people are not generally aware of what these descendants of Bharati, including his own wife, mm. have done in order to carry forward the work and the knowledge of his life and to start to to really bring about seminal incidents in that process, you know, like the publication of the biography, or in my mother's case, the publication of the first critical study. And I have no hesitation in saying that I think that the deep seated misogyny in, in the Indian cultural tradition is what drives that neglect. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we tend to just push aside, well, this is work done by women, you know, I can get a leg up here, I don't need to give that precedence. Let me climb over it and, and, and be the one as a man. And uh, since we're speaking very frankly here and, and need to, I think if we're going to talk about Bharati at all, this has been the reality of Indian society. And I'm sure that it has changed since Bharati's time, but the change is a slow and ongoing mm. process. Mm -hmm.